I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucer. The whole fleet of them, what dumbass is The acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Anomalous. We have spacecraft from another species. We do, yeah. How many? Quite a number. Since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and two thousand reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. everybody and welcome to this special edition of the Unidentified Anomalous Podcast. As always, I'm Digby Ferno and joining me is my wonderful co-host, uh, Tom Cortex Zero. Tom, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Digby. I'm doing really good. I feel great. Uh, this week has been pretty fantastic. Last couple of weeks have been just remarkable, the guests that we've had on. And today is kind of continuing in that in that same spirit, I'm I'm absolutely ecstatic for the conversation today. I've been thinking about this all week. We both have. So without further ado, Professor Simon Holland, how are we doing, my friend? Excellent. It's really an honor to be on your podcast. And we've got lots of things to talk about. So that's a good loads. good start. <laughs> yeah. We've got loads. Now, for anybody that hasn't seen it, Professor Simon Holland released a video on his YouTube channel last week that's been making the rounds on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, um, yeah. about a discovery uh, that you found, I believe, um, that uh, has come out of SETI. Uh, should we start with what you found there, and then we'll talk around it and, and get more in-depth about, about the whole subject? Well, I didn't find it. I mean, that's, that's the subject, really. Um, right. I, I, was a, I mean, obviously, I'm open to... Um, revealing uh, confirmation of UAP and interesting things. I don't think we'll, we, we I, I'm, I'm a very uh, non-believer in government and military disclosure. And I was trolling along doing my normal stuff on <clears throat> YouTube or my channel. And um, I got recontacted by an old acquaintance who I know is a very serious person, a senior person in British radio astronomy and also in EU um, organization of putting big radio telescopes together. And he just came out and said, hey, Simon, did you know that SETI found 18 alien signals uh, using their screensaver uh, SETI at home? I went, no, tell me more. And so he, because I know who this person was and I'm protecting his identity, but he certainly knows his stuff. Um, I said, what's going on? And he goes, well, you know, SETI at home was a screensaver uh, run by SETI. Now, I, I, this is in the film, but I think it's important to repeat um, what he said and what actually happened. So... SETI, um, Drake and Sagan, way back in the 60s, wanted to use uh, radio telescopes, a way of listening to the universe, uh, not mm -hmm. optical telescopes, to search for a signal. But at the time, radio telescopes' time was really precious, and they were big physical devices that you had to steer around and point at stuff, and you had to choose very specifically the frequency that you listened to. So yeah. they said, well, what are we going to listen to? And they came up with a very intellectually brilliant but very limited idea, and that was the one thing that is omnipresent in our universe is the buzz, and it, uh, I've worked in radio telescopes. If you turn a radio telescope on, you hear hydrogen. Hydrogen has a hydrogen. distinctive radio frequency. It's a very, very well-known, um, yeah, it's a, it's a well-known sound. It's a rushing sound that you actually, it's a pain in the backside to actually filter it out and listen to, maybe you're looking for pulsars, maybe you're looking for other um, you know, natural 
things. But what um, Frank Drake and Carl Sagan said was, well, maybe the aliens know about the omnipresent buzz, annoying buzz of hydrogen, so maybe they would use that to modulate or send a signal um, to say, hi, we're here. Um, not so much a, a, just a signal of their activity, but an actual message. And they found nothing. <laughs> nothing. For, <laughs> you know, not, it's absolutely true. I mean, it's the classic media statement. They didn't. For years and years and years, and the limited time that SETI could buy or steal from big telescopes in Europe and places, you know, places like Green Bank in the US, <clears throat> they listened and they heard nothing. Well, they heard a big whooshing sound. <clears throat> and so SETI at home came up by the 1990s came up with this brilliant idea was why don't we listen to every signal why don't we listen to see if we can hear something in the quiet bits not on the hydrogen frequency but please sir please sir we have a big problem with this is that we don't have the computing time and money to actually process mm -hmm. analyzing all the signals by then radio telescopes weren't just a single frequency you could have omnidirectional multi-frequency uh, receivers at these big places but you had no computing power to look for it so berkeley university through a fantastically named open software source remember that called boink even <laughs> even better name um wrote this very beautiful uh, as people still run it today, screensaver called SETI at Home, that was the idea was let's crowdsource the raw signal to the world, whoever, a few hundred people, they thought, would sign up for it. And then we can look, get their PC to analyze and see if there's anything that stands out like a wow signal or any, anything which is odd, which is maybe technological or mechanical or, or evidence of aliens. That's what they were looking for, SETI. And so they sent out um, the raw data Interestingly, I didn't know this. Most of it was collected by Arecibo while it was still alive. And um, what happened next is an incredible story, is instead of getting 200 people, 2 million people mm. um, downloaded SETI at Home Screensaver. It was... I know, I I've had... had yeah, had. yeah, we, we we had yeah, we all had it. I've heard from IT professionals who said, um, you know, I I installed the entire computer network for a British Petroleum or the BBC, and it was up to me, the IT person, to choose the screensaver because you know people leave their computers on all the time, and I just used to put put SETI at home on everything that I had my control over. <laughs> I love so it. Be, I love it. Yeah. And I know that's true. Almost everybody, you guys, brilliant. We all ran it. Um, but did you ever hear, you know, Tom and Dickby, did you ever actually hear back from SETI at home from <laughs> Boink? Did you ever hear your Not computer? You know, did you get feedback? Not that yeah. I can remember. I mean, no. I, was young, no. I was young. I was really young. <laughs> well, yeah, but a lot of people have said that. So um, they they were really overwhelmed by the number of people who got on it. Um, and the key word that I said a couple of sentences back was it was open source. So because mm. that was the kind of hippie principle mm. of Boink and Berkeley. And, and that was the deal that, that Berkeley had done with SETI to disseminate this throughout the world. So it turns out, this is a new piece of information I didn't know, that because SETI and SETI at home and SETI itself and this signal was open source, that other organizations could analyze it. And this guy said that there's a SETI Europe, which I didn't know. I think there's anybody can be SETI, really. We think of it as American, but it's not. And a, a SETI organization at a university in Italy um, was able to, one, use the multiple users' data. Um, oh, I'm missing a vital part. So Boink and Berkeley had too many users. So instead of sending, they didn't have enough data to share with 2 million people. Mm -hmm. So instead, they sent the same data over and over and over again to people throughout the world, um, not to disappoint them, 
to think to make them believe that they were looking for aliens which they genuinely were and this italian university used the multiple repeats and the open sourceness of the data to find a new way of looking for something and i can go into great detail because he did to me of what how they did it it was a very interesting piece of mathematics and uh, and what they were looking for that seti didn't tell you to that mm. they'd found and so Right. They found 18 um, technological signatures, not from stars, but from planets in our galaxy, from sources that weren't a, a stellar source, but a planetoid source that they could isolate that enough. And all I'm going to say is what they found was it was as if you had a transistor radio, if you remember what they were, and you were on the moon, and you turned in, and you could tune into the whole bandwidth of the Earth. You would hear yep. AM, FM, Wi-Fi, radar, anything. Right. You would hear a technological sign signature from a distant Earth that goes bzzz, but you can't yep. resolve anything, right? But that's an enormous sign that there's, there's something down there. So... I, I I bought the story. He said every time <clears throat> these 18 sources came round, Arecibo doesn't move, the Earth rotates, and every time yes, these 18 course. sources came round, the same signals would repeat, and they would be distinctive because there was a Doppler shift. There was a red, there was a compression of the wavelength, and, uh, and then a decreasing of the wavelength as the planet moved past. And um, that's what I put in my film. And he phoned me up afterwards and said, Simon, you missed an important bit. And I said, what's that? He said, while they were in view, they also could detect the Doppler rotation of the planet. I went, oh, okay. I don't think I, I it missed my tiny brain. So, so of their planets. Yeah, of the ET planet with the radio buzz that is obviously a source of radio of RF signal, and I'll get on to what it could be. Um, not only did it Doppler increase in frequency as the planet approached Arecibo and Earth, they got a rotation of the planet while it was in view and then a decrease as Earth turned and Arecibo left one of the 18, excuse me, sources. So, so yes, ask questions. Do we have an idea of how far away or what planet this is? Yeah, he does, and he doesn't want to tell me. Um, <laughs> he, I know, but we, we should get on to this whole thing about, about proof, about social media, about breaking stories, because I think this is really the nub of it. I mean, I've told you what I know. Um, he obviously knows more. He says it's, in, it's obviously in our galaxy. It's not in a distant galaxy. Um, he kind of slightly did give me a, I asked all this, that was exactly the question I asked. And the next question is, what are they saying? <laughs> which is, <laughs> um, which everybody's been asking me and his, rep I'll tell you his reply, which I didn't really put in the film. Um, he said that they're, um, they're relatively local to us, um, because um, anything too far away, you wouldn't hear. So there is yeah. a kind of attenuation of the signal. So they have to be w within, um, I'm going to lie to you, they're within 25 light years. I'm being very intentionally vague. I, I, um, f for, a g for a good reason. But, but um, anything way distant in the center or the far side of the Milky Way, our galaxy, we probably wouldn't yet have the technology to, de to detect. So all I can definitely say he told me is that they're a local source. And also but, I would say that it can't be too far away either. Because right. otherwise, I mean, let's look at it this way. If they're doing it intentionally, if they're more than 25 light years away, I mean, I would say probably if I was yeah. guessing, I'd say it's probably a little bit closer than that because we're looking at 50 years for a round trip message. Um, that's that's also something we have oh to we're do. jumping ahead we're jump we're okay okay we'll slow down okay I am, yeah round trip message oh no 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 yeah that's another enormous kind of other thing to talk about but no all that seti at home because of the mass vast number of people like you looking at it and a very yeah. smart team in italy 
ascertained was there was a buzz and a technological RF frequency of alien RF frequency. I mean, they're not they're not human. They're not. People said to yes. me, "What's their radio? What's their music?" No, they're aliens. You know, they're Mister <laughs> and Mrs. Blobby. You, you can't you can't even begin to imagine how different they're going to be. But we get there is a tech. Well, don't we? With yeah, the, yeah, like, we're, AI and UAP and stuff like that. It, it's designed to separate it, so we don't start thinking, "Oh, we're talking about little green men." But you know, we are essentially talking about alien life here, and people need right. to get grips with that. You have to get a grips with it. You can't put our terra firma ideas on any of it. So here's one thing that I have to say: there is no proof, really that it isn't a natural occurrence. It might be a planet that's made of a quartz crystal that's vibrating. All mm -hmm. that the signal really picked up was a technological signal, which is very different from the usual uh, background that you get from anywhere else. And there were single point sources, that's, that's what he said, um, of these, uh, of what seems to be um, a signal, uh, which is energy in the radio frequency f spectrum of the electromagnetic frequency. And um, I pushed him on this, and then he dropped a real bombshell. He said that um, they now have discovered that the RF, which is like a carrier wave, isn't natural because it's being modulated, meaning it's being effed with by extraterrestrials meaning it's a real it is a source of a technological you know somebody doing something uh, technological um i have no idea if that's true i don't have a radio telescope i guess your viewers and you don't either but no, if we no. believe that then that's a really big re revelation because as i said it might just be a, 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 a pizza electric quartz barbecue signal that we're hearing but if the signals actually being modulated and changed that would mean that there's that they're using that something is using it as a communication device is it true i'd love to know because <laughs> in your video as well you said that there was a belief that the signal was images and it was data as well <laughs> right well <clears throat> all right all right images and data so of course so i think this is a good time to raise this whole issue of mm -hmm. You know, what do we believe? Where are we going to get interesting bits of information from? Are we going to tune into uh, BBC local radio and be told about modulated alien pictures of it from a distant point source? Uh, no, we're not, because it's very hard for them. And, you know, that's my background as a journalist to actually I have got no verification of this. I've got no secondary source information. I just know that the person who told me is is right up there and is sensible. And everything that I asked, um, he replied to. But can I verify it? So the New York Post, the Washington, whatever, and the BBC are never going to touch this with your barge pole. I mean, they just they just really wouldn't do it. But I think... That's why your podcast today and maybe my tiny channel are the place to actually listen for um, confirmation of interesting things because you're not going to hear it for anywhere else. Your, your government's certainly not going to tell you. They wrote the rules on secrecy. And don't ask the military because they're uh, controlled by probably by defense contractors who are making money out of this. They're not going to no, tell you that. either. No, we know that all too well. Don't we know that. <laughs> don't we know that we we know that very well yes so um so. you're you know you're doing a great job if you're if you high viewers if you're interested in these kind of stories social media is where it is going to break but you're also going to get possibly to use a catchphrase of mine bollocks i mean do, can we you know it might be true I believe this guy, I'm not making it up. I'm certainly yeah. not doing it for money or any, I've got no vested interest in this. I want to spread the word. Money. Yeah. Money? What's that? <laughs> yeah, I know. Quite. One day I might make some money out of this show, but we're not quite there yet. But uh, and, and actually, while uh, no. we're on the subject of money, you know, and this, you know, you we may not be able to uh, identify the person you're speaking to and 
God, I don't want you. No, to don't, say. don't try, please, yeah, don't. I'm not try. going to. I'm yeah, no, no, to. no, we won't do that. <laughs> but one yeah. way to find um, validity in the claims yes. will be following the trail, uh, the money trail. Now, right, right. I did some research yesterday, and I know that there was a, an Australian tech guy last year that passed away, and in yes. his will there was two hundred million dollars oh. donated to SETI. That's that's a lot of money for somebody to leave to an organization like SETI that apparently hasn't found anything yet. Hasn't found anything. Apparently. Yeah, well that was yeah, brilliant, Tom. I mean that uh, Digby, that was really insightful because that was the only clue which I when I really pushed this guy, you know, who's the Italian university, what's the signal, you know, what have they found? He said, Well, the one thing that you can look up independently, he's named a few names of some scientists who are into this, which I haven't gone public with. But the one thing, absolutely, Digby, that you said is follow the money. If you look, what's happened since the signal supposedly was found, or just recently, is that the EU and specifically Australia, which is also interesting because it's not in the EU, uh, has, has, has joined together the biggest radio telescope network ever and a very large amount. I got the figure wrong in my film. Um, I get, I sadly, effed up and quoted the entire EU science budget, which isn't quite as big as is being spent on this. Right. But between between six, and I admit that, between six and nine million uh, euros are being spent on networking telescopes. So Jodrell Bank and in Holland and Germany, interestingly, the guy said a new telescope, which is currently semi-secret in Africa because it's radio quiet and the something called the Square Kilometre Array in rural Australia, all of Australia is rural, apart from the bit that's <laughs> not, is, uh, is now part of this um, real-time fiber optic network. So you effectively you've, you've turned the planet into a radio telescope. Uh, why? Yeah, I mean, it could be basic science, but why now? I think it's, there right. could be something, yeah, I don't know. The timing Tom, we is interesting, isn't the it? Other day, we were talking the other day, Tom, and you looked up how yeah. much the Hubble Space Telescope cost to build. Can you remember uh, that? Uh, yeah. Uh, James Webb. Yeah, sorry, James Webb. Oh, James, James Webb. Webb. Wow. James Webb was, was uh, 10 billion US 10 billion. dollars. Right. So, but, you know, 200, so 200 million dollars donated by an Australian tech guy who died, passed away. Oh, fascinating. So they, yeah. so they received that in on November yeah. last year. And that's confirmed. I've got that confirmed by multiple sources. You can look it up. It's, it's, okay. on, it's online. Anybody can verify that. So good. some tech guy decided that 200 million was a good amount of money to leave to SETI, an organization that apparently hadn't actually found anything. Right. It would seem to me that a tech guru that's quite involved in all of this could possibly potentially know more than Joe Bloggs, who, you know, and Alan, who lives down the road, uh, and left the money to them for a very good reason. Alan! And now and in... <laughs> Alan! <laughs> no, it's Steve. Oh, sorry. Uh... Steve! <laughs> no, right, yeah. Um, has left right. it for a very good reason, you know. Right, they've got to have something to spend the money on. There's obviously something they needed, and there must be a reason behind that. So With everything think, going yeah. on in the world, you have to you have to present something convincing at this particular time to get anybody on board with yes. putting up that kind of money in funding. Yeah, like yep. it just won't yeah. happen in the modern day with all of the different conflicts going on. Plus, right, we're hearing this story. While there is a push for disclosure in the United States where there's these whistleblowers like David Grush has come out, there's yeah. uh, a concerted effort by Congress, or at least certain yeah. members of Congress, to change laws to protect these individuals. Like, I, it uh -huh. just, it all feels very coordinated to me. It all feels like it's coming to a head. It really does. I can't deny that. Right, right, right. I mean, I think the other, that's, that, that's brilliant. I think the, the other thing that I push to my source on is why it, why are you telling me and why isn't this public? And what he said was quite interesting. He said that um, everything is coming together. We are in a program right now where the public awareness um, has changed. Um, you know, UAP are real. Um, 
British MOD have admit, admitted that first in the Condine report, which is brilliant. Um, people now recognize that there are highly strange things out there. Um, and it's could that be a kind of grooming exercise to slowly break, because it's big news for humanity to say that we've definitely um, found a source, which is you know non-human intelligence out there. Um, you, Digby, you asked about communicating with them. I've uh, that's a whole other can of worms. Um, you t you also brilliantly said you know how long the signal would take at at light speed RF frequencies. So I mean that yeah, there's another big subject in how you would communicate with an extraterrestrial race. Uh, but Tommy, I mean, you're right. I think there is a a drip feed of disclosure. Um, Good word. Not, yeah, that's, that's, ha that's um, slightly happening. That's what when yeah. we spoke to Matt Ford the other day. Yeah, uh, and a couple other people. Uh, I was in a space with a UFO researcher uh, Grant Cameron a few days ago, and oh, he yeah. specifically yeah, yeah. used that phrase "drip, drip, drip, drip." And I had first thought yeah. about that idea in like maybe 2014. I used to be on a forum. Right called above top secret that some people are probably familiar with it used to be very different back in the day i was searching that in the early 2000s and right, uh, right. you know doing my own personal research and going to yeah. the library and such and right. i said you know if they really just wanted to come out and tell us the best way to do it would be to do it slowly i always compared it to like walking into a very cold pool in the middle of the summer like some right. people just dive right in, but then there's like a shock to the system, right? That's your ontological shock. But if you go in feet first, get used to it, little yeah. by little by little, next thing you know, you're up here in neck and water. You've got yeah. to just jump in. You've got to just jump in. But now I think we're ready for it. I do. I really believe that they can at least give us basic information, which is why I find your story so interesting. Because I feel that... Yeah if something is in our neighborhood that they've already found it and that it's just a matter of handling how they want to tell us handling. Yeah. The handling of how they want to tell us, because I mean, I think there's, it's quite well known. It's been documented lots of times that secu security services, military and government are particularly worried about, and people have done surveys with the public, r with religious groups, with people all over the world about how, what, how would we reveal this? It's a bit, it's people have asked that very question. And it seems to me that the, that you're quite right that it needs to be slow acclimatization and that's what seems to be happening um it's it's in the public domain now i mean there's a lot yes. of crap talked about it but i think the concept has been raised in the public awareness and maybe what's behind it is that something has definitely been found well certainly well, yeah yeah I think, I mean, the, the moves in the States are amazing, you know, the congressional hearings and everything like that. Right. But you do have to think, you know, well, they're not going very far with it, are they? And it's almost like it feels like it's by design. It is part of, yes. part of the drip feed. So, you know, right. we've got to look at the bigger picture here and realize mm -hmm. that even perhaps the people that we think are on our side are still part of the same system mm -hmm. that's trying to keep it from us at the same time. So we need to realize that. Yeah. And, uh, and Simon, as you said earlier, you know, this news is going to come through social media. It's going to come through somebody having uh, a breakthrough, getting the evidence they need, yeah. getting it out there on social media or on Twitter first where it can't be taken back. And then people can, you right. know, uh, analyze it and look for themselves. Somebody put something up on, on I saw on Facebook today earlier, um, yeah. a dear friend of mine, and it was April Fool's Day is the only day that people actually critically look at something on the internet to try and decide whether it's true or not. And <laughs> oh, then, that's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. And I think we should be right. doing that more. Right. Right. Um, it's no it, yeah, it's the one day where you don't have confirmation bias in yes. in, in 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 agreeing that it agrees with you, but you go yeah. uh yeah, what they uh, what are uh, they how are they pulling my leg? Is it true? That's I love yeah. it. Yeah, uh, good point. I thought that was I thought that was a good one. <laughs> um, oh. But yeah, I mean, finding the funding um, is, is an interesting one and fun, uh, finding the money yeah. trail. You know, if the EU has donated nine million to SETI uh, for, for, for funding, that in itself is no small 
change when you know there's 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 crisis going on on uh, over Europe, uh, UK. Right. You know, cost of living is through the roof, and you mm -hmm. know they have they have to be able to justify right. going. Well, let's spend nine million pounds on this, right? You know, oh, so following the trail yeah. of money, that yeah. it sounds like there is something to this. Um, there is another possibility is think that this could be an EU USA space race. Um, I specifically said to this contact, I said, so what, what the Americans, what's North America doing about the alien signal? And he said, they don't know about it. I went, no, they must. Mm. He said, well, they probably know about it through, um, through, you know, through contacts and gossip and things. But he claims that the radio telescope network, which has now been funded, this inter this interconnecting of radio telescopes through Horizon, which is the European Science Funding Project, is way above um, the funding level and the interest that North America is doing it. So he, he thinks that e EU are really have leapfrogged any North American uh, interest in this, um, which kind of makes sense, maybe. I don't or, know. Or, or maybe the American interest isn't there because they don't care because they've got bigger fish to fry because they they already right. have more information than Europe. You know why? What you know? Right. If, you, if you've got right. if you've got a crashed UAP in in your in your garage lockup down the road and loads of people are doing some tests on it, and <clears> then the Europeans are still looking for uh, for yeah. signals in the sky you'd be like well we don't need to look for signals in the sky because we've already got the mother load you know maybe there's a sense of that it's like yep let them have their signal without sounding patronizing i don't mean that you know i'm european or, well used to be before brexit and now i live in morocco so i can't really <laughs> well, whatever i am you know i don't know anymore me too yeah <laughs> child of earth expat <laughs> uh, yeah child of earth um you know, maybe, yes. maybe that's the case. Maybe the Americans don't care about SETI. Maybe they yeah, don't care about point. finding the signals because they've already got the contact. Uh, and, you know, I have my personal belief is that certainly with America and probably most likely with most other countries around the world, certainly superpowers, yeah. um, have an extensive knowledge of yeah. this subject. I think that's fair well, to I say. I mean, something that certainly my channel on youtube has been knocking on about for ages now is the is the uh looking at the physics of uap um you know we very much came up with the idea of weaponizing uap you know if you can understand um how they work and how they don't fit into normal aerodynamics you can back engineer not how not to make one but at least you can begin to understand um how possibly you could have that kind of propulsion or that type of way of traveling faster than light or whatever they do, you know, um, I th definitely defense contractors have been looking at sightings because I get this all the time from people who have seen things, they are immediately contacted and they want minutia detail of timings and parallax and things that they know and that information is going right back to large defense contractors who of course as you both know are outside freedom of information because they're not government right. that's right. how it works <laughs> um and so the weaponization of uap i think has been real uh is real and has gone on for a long time um so yeah, you're right. I think I think they've definitely been studied. Uh, there's a lot to learn from the unknown. Um, we had a really interesting chat last week with Professor Avi Loeb. He was on our show last week. Oh I'm yeah, sure we were very right. familiar with. Uh, yeah. And he, he, we were having a similar conversation with him, weren't we, Tom? About you know potential means of propulsion and how would yeah. they get here and how long that it would take. Incredible. And then, bringing in the the conversation of the inertia of gravity and yeah and all of yeah. it it's it's it blows my mind tom I is far more say, technically though, minded about this stuff than i am yeah. well i appreciate that Digby. but i i will say too thinking about uh your story there's a couple of things that that cross my mind mm -hmm. one is that you know I, i've given your channel and essentially like your resume a good look and i'm like this guy's not going to put this video out unless he's pretty confident in the individual that gave him this information so that yeah. gives me a certain level of confidence as far as the credibility of what you're talking about which is exciting to someone like me i'm an experiencer 
Like right. I had a craft only a couple hundred feet over my head as a child. Like I know oh. these things are real. That there's no debate for me, right? Yeah. Like as far yeah. as their nature and origin, that's a whole different story. But yeah. then I also think how weird some of these cases are the high strangeness, the paranormal aspect. Mm -hmm. I feel that there's a very mm -hmm. good possibility that whatever they're detecting with these signals may be separate from some of the things that are interacting with us here. They may be two very different things mm -hmm. that are just around us. That's why I also find this exciting. Yeah. Like whatever's yeah. going on on that planet, I, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the ones that are coming here with their craft. Like, I feel like well, there's a lot more going on, perhaps, you know, folded into other realities. And and of course, uh, yeah, the math would tell you that there should be other civilizations popping up all over the place around us. Right. I, I feel like th that now we are reaching this apex of, mm -hmm. hey, people are starting to catch on to the fact that, like, okay. you know, we've been lying to them for a very long time and they're just yeah. putting all of their ducks in a row to do this in such a way that yeah. they don't have to take as much accountability and responsibility for the things that they've done in the past. And if they right. could, to the nth degree, if possible, they mm. want to try to make this as a new emergent phenomenon. They don't want people thinking about Roswell. They don't want think people thinking about uh, Rendlesham Forest and things of that sort, these cases that have already happened, the Belgian UFO flap. They would right. like for people to believe that this is newer, but that's right. not going to happen. <laughs> Oh, that, that's very smart, very smart. No, there's absolutely no evidence. And, and these planets were, aren't sending, these point sources of RF aren't sending out a message. We're, we just now have the technology to detect that they're active. And you're right. I mean, there's no, there's, I mean, it's like, like, how, how would you relate that they are the ones visiting Earth. Well, it's apart from they might be a source of of some form of advanced technology. But I mean, they could be, you know, they could be the I Love Lucy show from the 1950s. They could be at that level, still flying right. around in aluminum yeah, airplanes. Right. Yeah. That'd be I mean, incredible that's to what see. What I was going to say is that it's actually because we're receiving RF um, frequencies, you would imagine that potentially an advanced civilization would have a different form of contacting and transmitting information. Right. So you, you, I would say that actually receiving something like this from a close by star or some, uh, a planetary system, Planet, yeah. um, they, they might not be any much further advanced than we are or about on the same evolution. But or then that behind, right, right. Or behind. Right. But cause they yeah. couldn't be too far behind, otherwise they wouldn't have our... RF, so they're you know right. they're within a hundred years, a hundred years, yeah, them, which is uh, amazing, equivalent of our. Yeah, but then also that just came into my head. Just raises another question: is mm -hmm. finding the likelihood of having another planetary system with life um, forming on it. You know, it mm -hmm. is is less than likely if it's in our very backyard right now. Even if the universe is teeming with life, so let's say that they're four right. light right. years away. You know, the, the chances are, you know, still quite remote, but for them to also be on the same evolutionary path and uh, about the no. same sort of technological level as us at the yeah. same time, yeah. that also yeah. seems to reduce the chances of that being the case. So oh, maybe completely. we are being sent a message. Maybe we are being sent a message with these means on purpose, because uh, as far as they're aware, that's the only way that we would notice what it is. Maybe, oh, so maybe like it. it is intentional. There's so many yeah. possibilities. That's Do you know what I mean? That's a, something... Fascinating. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, yeah, because, you know, they're not going to send it over to us with technology that we don't have the ability to receive. It's like, well, we want to speak to them. Let's, let's right. you know, knock, knock plus, on the door plus, first before we kick in the back one. Plus, of course, we, as incredibly trapped in our own sense of reality of physics, are only looking um, uh, with large ears called radio telescopes into things that we can imagine we might find. And, yeah. you know, as you say, Tom, I mean, the, the idea UAP manifests themselves um, as a, a physics which we don't really understand. You know, they're, they, they have quantum 
um, um, observations where some people can see them, other people can't. They seem uh-huh. to me to be very much um, the w- when we see them, it's almost when they're changing energy state temporarily. Uh, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot like about that. how light is produced and 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 maybe a UAP when it kind of changes direction temporarily appears but its normal state is totally outside of what we perceive as as our reality so it it it, it um yeah no we're we're still cavemen in looking at radio telescope stuff you know <laughs> we really need to widen our search you know it's life gym but not as we know it means yeah. a big thing you know yeah you bring up yeah. a really good point about light too because some people oh, yeah. and reasonably so have asked the mm. question you know why do some of these objects even have lights and and i right. i thought about that and i'm like well Perhaps in certain situations, it's it's just an emergent phenomenon that occurs, like you said, when they're changing energy states. Uh, if it's, mm. say, Big mm-hmm. B had brought this up the other day, too. Uh, what if yeah. it's uh, a three-dimensional shadow of a higher-dimensional object? Yeah. Like, it, we're not seeing the whole picture, right? And then no. uh, Michael from UAP Studies, great podcast. Yeah. Him and Jason joined us on the show a couple of days right. ago. It was just it was it was on easter it was one of the best conversations we had and he said you know what if they've had developed the ability to divide themselves into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller parts and now they exist as like laws of nature laws of physics what if what if and i was like well you know what if they live on the head of a pin and they right. enlarge themselves to interact with our world and they're just like living on the quantum maybe that's why we don't see them it's because right. they only come out to play when they enlarge themselves. <laughs> it's like, honey, I shrunk the kids in reverse, right? It's, <laughs> it's all and that's, possible. And that's, that- no, it's very possible because, I mean, the quantum world, the, the world of the very small, obviously we have, through physics, we understand that the that quantum mechanics and the quantum is doesn't behave the same way as macrophysics behaves so if you lived in a permanent um you know microscopic subatomic quantum world you know you've got the possibilities of uh, way faster than light travel you know with instantaneous quantum possibilities of being anywhere in the universe you know we know this we we use it in in everything that we actually do in the modern world you know we use sure. quantum physics so yeah no they could have evolved not or 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 have always been in that part of our universe you know they're mm. macro microscopic i mean they're subatomic sized i mean it's just unbelievable uh and yeah well i love the idea um <clears throat> I worked with uh, Brian Cox on Forces of Nature at the BBC, and we talked a lot about UAP, which is great. He doesn't like them, though. Yeah, because he doesn't want to talk about it that much, although he's been forced (laughs) by many podcasts to come out and say what he believes. But we had this really fascinating conversation uh, related to Forces of Nature, which was about, you know, how things work. And I was working on a film on light. And I just asked him this really basic question. I said, Brian, just explain to me how are photons produced? And he said, well, they're all pretty well produced in the same way. There's a few exceptions, but pretty well. When, and it's when something loses energy. Imagine you were an airplane and you're coming into land. You throttle back to descend to a low orbit. If you imagine electrons like that and other particles as well, when they descend and want to go into a more stable de- orbit, they have to throw away something. And what they throw away, we perceive as photons, as light. So g- back to y- your point, Tom, very much was, you know, is the manifestation of UAP when they are throwing something away? Because there's other cases where uh, molten metal and weird drippy stuff, it seems to be when when things change your state direction or they bugger off and go home or whatever or just change speed there is a manifestation there's a light source there's a feeling there's an aura or sometimes there's physical evidence i mean uh, fascinating isn't it (laughs) that's why we do what we do it's the most interesting thing in the world next to like 
God. Right. Like, really, like, and those types right. of ideas. That's why we do this podcast. That's why we contacted you. <laughs> oh, well, well, I'm honored. I'm honored because, yeah, I spend my day thinking the same things and speaking to people yeah. like you and, and sp speaking to a whole lot of people in different fields, but a lot of physicists. And, and yeah, and as I said, stay here, stay tuned, because social media is where is is where you're going to hear interesting stuff there's going to be there's it's a rabbit hole there's going to be red herrings waved at you but concepts and ideas are going to be floated um that could be really very revealing i think and i'm i'm open to doing it you know i break my own rules by saying i can't verify stories but it was good enough and i I, I know where it came from, and there was other other uh, evidence that I th I think it's a quite a likely story, and even even if it's complete bollocks, it's intriguing enough to think of the concept and wonder what's actually going on, and I think that's what you guys are doing. It's brilliant. I, I think if you can deliver information um, like this, and yes, okay, so you haven't got it verified by two or three other sources, okay, but you're not no. claiming that you have. What that's no. doing is putting the idea out there to the general mm -hmm. public. You know, it's putting the, and, you know, no. let somebody else start looking into it, see if they can verify it, see if they can get some other information. You know, social media has the ability to allow all of us to connect and work together as a team. And if exactly. we can support each other and back each other up, then we can get somewhere. But while we're being thrown, as you said, red herrings and disinformation yeah. and your Mick Wests and your Stephen Green Streets and, uh, and all that lot right. out there, <laughs> throwing in misdirection, it, it's difficult. And that comes back to what I was saying. You know, you have right. to be very critical of what you look at, uh, at online. Try and yeah. decipher it. Don't get swayed by the distractions that were being fed because it's right. the distractions that we get fed that would be proven to be false. And that's what the media pick up on. Oh yeah, yeah you this could, one. Yeah, it, it was it's fake. It's like, well, that's just because that's fake doesn't mean everything else is fake. No, uh, you could just it, dismiss everything. You could say there's no UAP, nothing. It's all rubbish, and it's not. I mean, there's something there that we need to investigate. And the other thing, Digby, that I'd like to say is, I, I'm totally honoured on a daily basis to wake up and have an email from somebody who works in defense contractor physics at a university or SETI or whatever, who says you're on the right track, keep digging, or actually tells me something. When we've been looking at um, um, Rendlesham Forest incident, which is a big subject that I've been covering, um, we reach out and say, did you build the antenna at Cobra Mist on Orford Ness? And I've heard from the guy with a backhoe with a JCB. And I said, how deep was it? Because I know the questions I want to ask him. And I've heard, I've heard people who work at Martlesham Heath supposedly working for the GPO and they weren't, you know, people are willing to tell you stuff. I've, I've heard from somebody who works at, um, RAF Boardsy, which was supposedly closed down. And he said, closed down my left f foot. Mm. I was 18 stories down in a complex you've never heard about. I mean, uh, he's not making it up. And oh. I know where he was. It's there today. You know. It's funny, it? especially with the British government talking about Renshaw and Forest, but they really yeah. don't want to touch the subject at all, no, do they? they? Don't, I mean, don't. They, yet, there was... was there was a brief conversation about whether they're going to have hearings and stuff like that brought up by one person in Parliament last week, and it was everybody was oh, sniggering yeah. at him and laughing at him, and it was like yeah. the Americans are taking it seriously, and they were like, "Well, you know, if the Americans are taking it seriously. We take what they're doing seriously. It doesn't mean we need to do the same thing. We'll let them have that kind of thing." Uh, but you yeah. know, it's, this this phenomenon isn't just an American thing. It's been around in the UK, around Europe. For, it's for global these years it's global it exactly. has to be yeah. yeah well yeah absolutely so obvious all the great yeah. cases from all over the world like the virginia case in brazil is a really good example and their government's yeah. been yeah. a hell of a lot more transparent with their own people than well, even South ours America has is. right like this is a regular part of life for some people and it, or if you go out into um 
you know, the Midwest and talk to, uh, you know, some of the, the Native American tribes out there. Like star people are like an integral part of their oral tradition that's been passed down through millennia. Like yep. this is that's that's the point I always make when someone tries to yeah. bring up the argument that, oh, this could be like Russian or Chinese or secret U.S. tech. I'm like, OK, maybe some of it now, now yeah. in 2024, but yeah. not during World War Two. Not when Ezekiel saw the wheel, not when Alexander the Great and his army couldn't cross a river because these things were yeah. swooping down at them. That just doesn't add up. <laughs> like, right. it doesn't make sense. And it's the same morphologies <laughs> being described with the same behavior and the same characteristics. Talking about there, that there was fire going uh, around yeah. the edge of the object. Well, that yeah. was their word for light. Right. 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 Like, this and, has been and, around and, yeah, totally. since the beginning of humanity. And, and they didn't in, have in, in all different cultures. Alexander the Great Sun, did they? Exactly. The Dogon yeah. tribe somehow knew that yeah. Sirius was yeah. a, a, bin or a binary star system when they didn't wow. have telescopes, and they said that that no. information came to them uh, through amphibious beings that came down from yeah. the sky. And, like, uh, what... Like, okay, storytelling and, and, and fairy tales and that sort, like, those... Those types of oral traditions mm -hmm. weren't as prevalent back then as they are now. Like uh, storytelling right. has advanced and has, uh, but back then, it was almost considered like very sacred to record information, pictograms, yeah. carvings, and such. Yeah. So they were recording what was happening because they wanted to save it for later to teach later generations. It was the earliest form right. of history class. So. Right. They're not going to waste their time talking about something that didn't happen back then. Like all, yeah. all they always taught us in school about all these myths and legends and such and I'm like, yeah. Now I don't think that's the correct word for for those things. Now it's um stories that need to be translated into modern language because they were real events. Right, we should reinterpret them. Have you come across the wonderful Beatrice Villarreal? So she oh. runs a project called Vasco uh, out of Vasco. Stockholm University. Yeah, and it's so recent, and it's such a brilliant question. So in the 1950s, the U.S. Navy did an ultimate wide-field star map for navigation, and it was pre-Sputnik, October 1957. So pre-Sputnik, she has... a large plates done by the US Navy of the entire night sky and she has them today and what she's found is that there were things in orbit orbiting our earth prior to Sputnik um what mm -hmm. you know it's unbelievable evidence and she's also found what she's called vanishing stars um point sources which literally aren't there today that were in 1952 stars That's don't amazing. disappear uh yeah you speak to beatrice she's wonderful and she's part of scu she's working with avi loeb on galileo yeah. oh, and wonderful. she runs her own program and have you done last... any videos on this yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll send you Digby a link, and you can put it in the description. It's an interview yeah, with. Um, it's it's in orbit prior to Sputnik. Uh, I would love Beatrice. to hear more about this because I've heard this story. I've I've <clears> heard <throat> reports of this that prior to Sputnik, that yeah. even Nikola Tesla was picking things up. That he was like, well, that must be coming from something that's in orbit around the planet. Like, yeah, the distance from when it was coming from was in orbit, and you know, and. Uh, you know, my my background, I've done a lot of uh, uh, astronomy and, you know, asteroids um, don't go in orbit around Earth. They're death plunge asteroids that <laughs> enter our atmosphere and, and burn up as meteors and we get them as aster uh, meteorites. But, but they don't go in orbit, so it wasn't that. Something was in orbit around Earth before Sputnik. That's so that, incredible. All right, and so she's got real good evidence. I mean, this is factual evidence of that. Um, what she has got is time exposures um, or multiple exposures, and you can see single point light sources that are following a dot to dot that you can join up. And by following four dots, you can work out distance and speed from Earth. And these were in orbit around Earth. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, wow. they were the, uh, the old Black Knight satellite and everything like that. That's probably where that story comes from. 
Yeah. Yeah, she no. presented a very good. You, um, I will post the link to my film, but you can also look. You might want to find the link. She told the same story at the Sol S O L Foundation yeah. oh, that we're very recently familiar. had. A, yeah, her talk, which is published online on that, discusses vanishing stars. So that's yeah, another story. Wow. I hadn't actually watched her video from Sol. I've but only I watched a few because there's actually many. Yeah, others. watch Beatrice. She's really good. And I'm sorry, I'm I'm talking far too much. No, no, go but for it. I, no, I'm just so I'm so enthusiastic. Uh, um, <laughs> I wanted to tell you another thing is that I've just interviewed um, uh, a guy who's just come back from Brussels because the EU are leapfrogging anything that Britain might snigger at, as they did last week, how annoying, in Parliament. But the EU are, are now, hopefully, if, if, if the resolution that they've, that they've tabled through a Portuguese uh, MEP is going to happen. We had him on the show last week. We interviewed him last week. Oh, well, you know what's going We're on. Yeah, We're well, good. Good, because we're on the ball. This, Seriously, this, we're on the ball on this show. <laughs> this is really going to be important news. Um, Europe are really going to be the powerhouse um, looking at phenomenon. They always have been. I mean, we, you know, I live in France. I know how good Jacques Vallée and, and, the, and the French reporting system is for UFOs. Um, but um, they tend to be ignored. So hopefully the EU, as you spoke to the MEP, will you know, we'll start funding this and take it Francisco more seriously. was great, actually. And what yeah. I really liked about Francisco is that he wasn't an experiencer. Guy. So he was doing it right. because he, you know, he wanted to get to the bottom of it. He wasn't, right. he wasn't sort of confused by the fact that he'd seen something that he can't explain. He just went, he's just, he's looking at it factually. He's looking at the information right. and the data and he's going, well, this, this must be something. So we've got to find it. Uh, yeah, I, just, I, I really too. enjoyed my right. conversation with him. Uh, Richard Good. Dolan had Beatrice on his show uh, as well. The, so that's going to, that, and I love Richard Dolan. I had the pleasure of meeting him on at an online UFO symposium uh, a few okay. years ago. He's, he's an extraordinary researcher. It's called Mystery oh. Objects and the Donald Menzel Conspiracy. We are actually oh, good. Have have another some of the images. Right. Good. We are actually talking to Basco at the moment, Tom. So Beatrice should be coming on the same show soon. Oh, so she, yo, I that, missed I'm, the last week. My mind is so <laughs> blown by this evidence. Um, th that's just incredible yeah. work. That I mean, really, that's great evidence that everybody can look at and be like, "Well, how do we ignore this?" It's you know. <laughs> yeah, but they will. Though. Two, they will. Though. Two pictures. No, no, no. They're pretty obvious. And Beatrice also, uh, because she had so much so many photographs it's you know the visible universe from earth is big that she actually crowdsourced a lot of the um of the comparison data mm. so you could actually sign up be, to be part of her vanishing stars project um and actually wow. compare um today and 1952 i think was the main mm. uh navy survey so yeah your viewers should get involved it's it's good well, stuff Love My to point do is, that. is that the news never picks any of this up, though, do they? they right. Um, That's our job. If they did, it would be right. on page 15 on a Wednesday when nobody's looking at the news and they'll go, mm -hmm. look, we covered it. So that's well, they I want mean, flying like, saucer don't... stories. Yeah, because... You know, they don't. They want. They don't want what we're doing. They don't want the science of UAP. They don't want to think. You know, as you said about. Yeah multi-dimensional beings coming into the quantum mm. that you know that doesn't sell the daily mail they want ufo lands in in well, suffolk and that's not the we, that's not the truth one thing i will say you know i'm not normally a daily mail fan uh but chris sharp who uh who writes okay. for the daily mail and he uh, runs liberation times chris does an amazing job but i will say okay. is that, that chris sharp actually, yeah. the daily mail print his stuff and his stuff is very thought well thought out uh -huh. very very in depth uh -huh, and good. i will say for the, you know if anybody hasn't looked him up look him up chris sharp um, okay but you know i'm not a big daily mail fan i'm not a daily mail reader <laughs> but we are a chris sharp on fan, this, in this sense you know they do allow him to publish these articles uh and he was the one what, what was it he broke he had frank mil he interviewed frank milburn last yeah. week before yeah. that it was yeah. the he unearthed the secret government crash retrieval program in the states Brilliant. um it's done loads loads of stuff but um right. the mainstream media don't take it seriously and if they if they yeah. do print something it's because they want to sort of snigger at it and make fun of it but uh they have their own agenda and uh mainstream right. media just do what they're told to do by uh 
more powerful people than them, I'm sure. Where was the European space, the European, I'll ask this question very carefully, where was the U.S. Air Force, European, North Atlantic, and European space crash recovery team based? Tom? Mm. Where was it based? I feel um, like I heard this. Well, right. At, at RAF Woodbridge, which is the sister station to Bentwaters, and they were there uh, recovering things um, during the so-called Rendlesham Forest incident. Oh. Large, heavy lift helicopters, euphemistically known as green giants, who got wonderfully yeah. involved in, in the Zeebrugger ferry disaster. But they were designed to recover anything, mainly spy satellites, that crashed in the North Atlantic or Europe. And they also, they regularly practiced with, uh, um, with NASA like objects in case somebody um happened to have an accident in the and they were in woodbridge hang on woodbridge wow what's no next kidding. to woodbridge oh that's that place called rendlesham forest rendlesham that's right yeah. uh it's all starting to add up wow no, there's so that. many <laughs> hidden secrets about the twin bases and oh it's funny i mentioned orford ness and bordsey oh and marshallsham heath hang on they're all circled by a piece of scrubby woodland. What's it called? Rendlesham Forest. <laughs> <laughs> My father in law more... lives in Woodbridge. I'll get him to go down and check it all out. Please do. Oh, and send it. Great. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Um, I have to go and feed my sheep because it's their supper time. <laughs> I love no that. Usually it's like I have to go eat dinner. I have to no. take a leak. I have a dog. No. <laughs> this is a no. good one. Feed my sheep. <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm a retired BBC film editor. Um, uh, I did teach at a university, but I never used the term professor. Uh, it's a nickname given by my people in my village here in France because of my <laughs> crazy hair. Your and, dog brown um, hair. Love it. We love it. I love it. it. You have a great look. It. Thank you. <laughs> It's 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 carefully abandoned. Um, but I, I, my Not wife like and I. Team. No, no, no. Uh, Iris and Dega, who are our sheep. We have a flock of 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 five um, Wesson French sheep and two goats. Uh, want their supper? They're calling me. We'll leave you to it, um, Simon. Thank, thank you, you so for much having me on. Me on. Yeah. It was welcome. a real pleasure. We have to do this again sometime soon, for Absolutely. sure. This was a great conversation. If you hear anything else, you get back to us. Sure, I would love to. Um, the weaponization of UAP is the subject. UAPs are real, and there's highly strange stuff out there. And we need to share what we know on social media. So thanks, we guys. We do. Thank we do. you. Thank so you very much. much. Uh, so from me, from Tom and from Simon, until next time, take care, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you for watching this episode of the Unidentified Anomalous podcast. If you like what you saw, please remember to hit that subscribe button and like the show. It really makes the difference to both myself and to Tom and helps the show reach a wider audience. So from both of us, until next time, take care. Bye-bye.